So hello everybody and welcome to the Centre for Child Protection's Critical Conversations in Child Protection webinar. Now, the objectives of this series are to facilitate learning from the latest research, practice knowledge, theory and lived experiences around safeguarding children and young people. It is for a multi-professional group of child protection professionals, including health, education, police, social workers, third sector organizations and more. Now, the center aims to get to the heart of child protection training using innovative ideas, as can be seen in our multi-award winning public engagement impact and research portfolio. We offer CPD certified training sessions using interactive and engaging child protection simulations and we deliver postgraduate programs, uh, particularly in advanced child protection, including a master's, a diploma, a certificate, and multiple standalone modules. And they're all for multidisciplinary child protection professionals, and they are all available through distance learning. Now, we are currently celebrating our 10 year anniversary through a series of events, including this webinar series, Critical Conversations. And this webinar series has plans to continue into the new year too. So please watch the space and keep an eye on our, our website for further uh, webinars. We also have a live celebration coming up really quickly. I think it's maybe two and a half weeks away now. This is on the 9th of November and we have keynote speaker, Professor Eileen Munro, as well as Professor David Shemmings, Professor Jane Reeves, Venetia and myself as well will be talking there too. So if you want to come, places are limited, please go on our website, um, email me, Venetia, we will be able to give you a link and make sure that you are um, hopefully able to book tickets if they're still available. Now at this event, the live event on the 9th of November, not this one, the webinar, we will also be announcing the winner of our inaugural Collaboration Award 2022. And I'm super excited about this. We have our panel later today and we've had some absolutely outstanding nominations. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that's going to pan out. Now, before I introduce the main event and the reason we've logged in today, just a few little housekeeping notes. So first of all, please note that we are recording the session um, so that it's available for a time limited public distribution. PowerPoint slides will be added to our website, though when we are working towards publications, the slides might be slightly modified. The videos um, are, and microphones are disabled for a few reasons, but briefly, this is just to ensure a smooth, easy to hear GDPR sensitive experience for everybody. Now the chat feature is enabled, um, and this is to encourage you to talk with us, with each other, to ask questions and to network. But a few just really brief notes about it. Chat is not recorded, so chat away. We do ask that you use chat responsibly and respectfully of others. And please note that Venetia, who's our presenter today, won't be able to read and respond to the chat directly. However, we do have chat monitors who will be answering non-specific questions, non-specialist questions. And we will pull out questions for Venetia, which we will uh, reserve and present to Venetia in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the session. So again, please use the chat to ask questions. Um, and again, we'll try to get to all of the questions, but we do, if we do run out of time and it's urgent, please contact us separately. Finally, please use us, join us on social media. You can tweet about the event by following hashtag CCP is 10, and that's 10 T-E-N versus the number, and or hashtag critical conversations. Now, without further ado, let's get ready for the primary event and why we're here today. So Venetia Jassal has been with the Center for Child Protection since 2012. She is a senior lecturer and the director of studies on our postgraduate programs mentioned earlier. She's also one of the co-chairs of the university's BAME staff network and the lead of our school's EDI initiatives. Venetia is currently studying and nearly finished with a PhD in exploring child sexual abuse in British South Asian communities, an area of policy and practice which very little is known. Venetia will now be talking more about addressing ethnic inequalities in child protection practice and why it's time we move beyond the research. So Venetia, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thank you very much, Tracy, and welcome everybody to this webinar. Can I start by wishing you all a very happy Diwali today? I want to say that I won't be saying anything hugely new or hugely 
radical today. So I want to start off by saying that only because I want to acknowledge that work on ethnic inequalities in child protection practice has been documented and researched by many, many before me. I am today standing on the shoulders of giants. So today I will be bringing in some new thinking from my own research and other research in which I have engaged. But I do want to also say that some of some of what you will be hearing today is information which you will all be very familiar with, I am sure. But the reason I decided to choose this topic for my webinar in this series is because we haven't really covered ethnic inequalities in child protection practice within the Centre for Child Protection and all the time that we have had the centre. So I really, really thought it qualified to be one of the critical conversations in the series. The subject of ethnic inequalities in child protection practice is multi-layered and multi-dimensional. And it's not always straightforward to achieve the objectives of delivering equal services to the children and families with whom we work. I know that we would all agree here today that the topic is important and that we are striving in all our areas of work to achieve this. However, data and statistics and research evidences that we still aren't getting this right, that there are still stark disproportionalities when you look at the experiences of minoritized ethnic children and their families. So on the one hand, we can argue that this is a complex, multidimensional and multi-layered subject in, to, to discuss and to tackle in our areas of work, practice and policy. On the other hand, I would argue that addressing inequalities is not complex at all. All it requires is time, space, and importantly, some honest conversations. And we need to question regularly why these conversations may not be taking place. So today is one of those conversations. So in short, it is a large subject, subject of discussion. Any topic looking at inequality, socioeconomic equality, inequalities, is a huge area and body of research. So I'm going to try to do a little bit of justice in this um, short time that I have today. The main point I wish to convey is, that as a minimum, we must remain cognizant about the issue, despite any challenges, either real or perceived. So we must really as individual practitioners, as individual as individuals responsible for carving out policy in this area, it's a plea, I suppose, to just remain abreast of why this is important and what we can individually do to address the inequalities. Through a brief systems analysis at the end of the webinar, I will seek to present some ethnic um, recommendations around ethnic inequalities from a micro meso and macro level, just so that it doesn't just become a theoretical academic discussion today. And finally, I just want to say that this in no way reflects a completed story today. So my own research is still continuing, as Tracy alluded to. It is in our large area, and this is just a brief synopsis, because as I said, I believe it deserves some attention as part of this series. So just a brief introduction really in terms of what I will be covering within, within the hour today. I will present a brief introduction to what the key messages of the webinar are. I will share with you key research studies since 2000 across the UK, so I will only be looking at the UK context in, ter in terms of ethnic inequalities in child protection safeguarding practice. There are many international studies which are very interesting, but the context doesn't necessarily apply. So it will mainly be UK research studies I will be sharing with you. I want to share with you my own research, uh, which is looking at child sexual abuse within British South Asian communities and what some of the data from that research is showing and what that means in terms of inequalities in safeguarding practice. And I want to end with a message of hope, really, and in terms of how we, we need to make transformational change and how we can be more proactive as individuals in making that change to address some of these inequal inequalities which will be highlighted today. 
So primarily, I want to start off by really acknowledging that ethnic inequalities in true UK child protection practice have been documented by many before me, and particularly across the last 20 years. So predominantly, Professors Lena Dominelli, Claudia Bernard, Prosperetta Dam are all names which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. There will be many more which I will be citing throughout the presentation, but it's really to acknowledge that this is not something new, this is something that has been studied and researched for many years now. I also want to acknowledge the emotional nature of undertaking research which ex exposes inequalities of any kind and thank those who have tried and continue to take up this mantle. I think in the context of child protection, when you start looking at ethnic inequalities, it is particularly emotive. And as a researcher myself, looking at this, I do want to really recognize that this is difficult work for researchers to explore and expose. So just to thank all those who have tried and continue to do so. So I want to be revisiting, re-emphasizing and re-energizing our efforts in addressing ethnic inequalities in child protection so that the impact upon children and families remains central to our practice. So, as I said earlier, we know that we need to do this. Um, we have some idea of how to do it. We try to do it sometimes effectively, sometimes not. But this is just about re-energizing ourselves in thinking along um, the, the issue of inequalities. And in the current context in which we live, inequality, socioeconomic inequalities are amplified more than ever so. So this, this whole topic of addressing inequalities, child protection practice should be at our forefront, forefront of our minds um, currently. So I want to emphasize that ethnic inequality should remain a serious cause for concern and the subject demands due attention. So this, this shouldn't be seen as something that we, uh, we, we tackle in an ad hoc way. It should be embedded into the fabric of our work and our organizations. So there is a real mismatch between knowing why inequalities need addressing and why they are not being addressed. So we want to sort of look at that. So why is it that we know we need to do this, but it's not really happening in terms of what the research is demonstrating? We must continue to reflect upon this and why progress remains inadequate and effective at large and what needs to happen to move practice and policy forward. I do want to say that there is some brilliant, fantastic work that is taking place to address inequalities and always has taken place. And I have had the um, honour really being part of some of that. Um, so it is to kind of present a, a more balanced approach in some ways that the, there are hundreds, thousands of practitioners who do lots of good work um, in this area and who do try their best within the resources and time they have to make sure that all children and young people, whatever their background, receive the service that they deserve and have a right to. But like I said, we are in the centre about research and an evidence base and, and, and is the, that evidence base I'm drawing upon today to show that we can still do better. We have legislation and professional codes of practice which really highlight that services obviously need to be delivered equally to all service users, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, disability, sexual orientation and socioeconomic background. So this is just a reminder that we have the frameworks in place to deliver an equal service, a fair service, an equitable service to all children and families who, who come our way, but um, that's not always um, shown to happen. So some of the research I'm going to be sharing with you is going to be um, discussed now. So as part of my research in my, my PhD study, I looked back um, over the last 20 years or so in terms of child safeguarding practice and services in the UK and found that there has for a long time now been a, a quite a well-known statistic which shows that there's an over-representation of black children in the child protection and care system. Less discussed is the underrepresentation of children from South Asian communities in the child protection and care system. So it, it's quite baffling that you know the overrepresentation of black children is, is a point that continuously gets discussed. Um, it's quite a common fact, I would argue, certainly in, in the discussions I've had with practitioners and managers. 
yet the disproportionality remains. So that's something I want you to just hold on to. In terms of South Asian communities, which is very much my body of literature that I've researched for my PhD, there is a real underrepresentation of children in the child protection and care system. And in, in terms of my research, child sexual abuse particularly. So we need to question what, what, why that is, what, what can we do to make sure that that is addressed. Um, we all have anecdotal evidence um, as to why what might be happening there. So the literature talks about cultural norms, cultural barriers across minoritized communities, which is preventing access to services, referrals being made. But really, it is, it is about not just accepting that as it is, but it, it is to unpick that and interrogate that more as practitioners. There's a growing body of research looking at the Gypsy Roma and traveler communities and how again practitioners set out to, to do good by, by the communities and um, to really set out to ensure that they deliver the services that the communities deserve. But there, in, in, in particularly in this research, it showed that there are still unconscious biases which creep in, which then leads to decisions being made which may not have been in the best interest of that child or family and does it demonstrate that there's not a sufficient cultural awareness of the, the family or the child's needs. And so this whole notion of cultural competency or the lack of creeps in again and affects the decisions that are being made and importantly, the impact upon children and their families. So race and ethnicity is definitely a significant factor which comes up when, when we're looking at any, any research around ethnic inequalities in child protection practice. So there's many scholars there who have looked at this and unpicked this, and there is a reference list at the end, and should you wish to, to explore some of this in more detail. But race and ethnicity is certainly something that is an important point that needs unpacking further when we're looking at inequalities of minoritized children and families. In terms of the lived experiences, I would argue there's not sufficient research in terms of how these inequalities actually impact the humans behind the inequalities. Um, there's a few phrases that um, how service users have felt demeaned and degraded, misunderstood and misinterpreted. So these are powerful feelings, um, but there's not enough research um, which really sort of documents how it makes service users feel. So inequalities has, I would argue, become a very theoretical subject matter, really. There's a lot of data on socioeconomic inequalities and, and, and mapped against that now in increasing body of ethnic inequalities and gender inequalities and safeguarding and child protection practice. But how does this actually make service users feel? Um, so just to share some research specifically around child sexual abuse. So Claudia Bernard, um, back in 2001, researched the experience of black mothers whose children had been sexually abused and found that they had experienced certain barriers uh, which were very much based upon their race and ethnicity, uh, which really need and needed to be explored further. So, for example, there was a real deep distrust of statutory services um, and which, which inhibited mothers reporting the abuse. Um, Davis, uh, Janine Davis is currently looking at the experience of British black girls and child sexual abuse and is also finding that there's a dearth of research in this area and is working really hard to to do what I was just saying early to really unpick what that means for the for the girls who are experiencing child sexual abuse in in, in those communities. So myself, as I've said, I'm, I'm looking at the experience of British South Asian females and child sexual abuse. And I found that there was a real paucity of research in this area, um, which led me to actually decide on my PhD topic um, and to really put the women who had experienced the abuse at the heart of the research. In terms of services, um, there is research documenting that child sexual abuse services are less available and accessible to minoritized children. Um, and often they receive a poorer quality of services than their peers. 
So we are a centre for child protection. So what all this means is that children and young people from minoritised ethnic communities are very much still at risk and not getting the support that they need and rightly deserve because of this issue not really being addressed in practice. So their experiences are very much still sidelined to some extent um, because we just don't know, we just don't have that body of research which really kind of experiences what it means to them in terms of their lived experiences. So there's enough research to say the ethnic inequalities exist, uh, but it's become very much an ap academic subject. But what does it actually mean for the child who is not accessing, say, a child sexual abuse service because the referral hasn't been made, they don't feel they can disclose because of um, certain barriers experienced within their communities? which I will come on to later. There is a limited access to interpreting services and the need for greater consideration of language barriers. So language barriers is a, a really huge barrier in terms of working with minoritized communities. And I appreciate that resources for interpreting services and the, the variety of um, languages that practitioners are encountering really in, in the diverse communities that we live in is vast and it is a challenge. And you know, as I say, resources are limited so that we have to work with the means that we have. However, this we have to still acknowledge that not being able to engage and communicate in what we take for real grant, granted verbal language and just to sort of express our needs and our frustrations, not having that is a real barrier. And it's something that we have to at least as a minimum be really empathic about and sympathetic to and try our best to really address otherwise families will re remain quite disengaged with the whole child protection system and um, have a really really um, negative experience research by Batty Sinclair and Price and more recently Bernard and Harris um, reviewed uh, child safeguarding practice reviews previously known as serious case reviews across several years to really look at how whether those cases identified race and culture sufficiently in terms of um, the impact on what the outcome was and for, for the child involved in those cases. And what they found was there was a real lack of critical analysis within practice reviews in terms of race and culture. And what that means is practitioners who generally um, look to an organisation to look to practice reviews for their learning um, have a very limited take away very limited learning in terms of what race and culture means if they not they're not actually in the practice reviews themselves so the practice reviews didn't tend to um, put enough emphasis upon the race and culture of the child and how that could have impacted what what would what then unfolded in terms of decision making and outcomes for the child so it's really important that race and cultural issues are looked at in all the work that we do and in, including in in practice reviews so that we can learn from those moving forward I want to share with you some recent research. So the previous slides have um, illustrated research, historical research, which has, has been undertaken over the last 20 years or so in this area. And uh, I want to share with you some research which I was involved in, some primary research in, in, with, with ListenUp, a research organisation which you may have heard of which was set up specifically to amplify the voices of uh, minoritized ethnic children, young people in, in the safeguarding and child protection arena. So Listen Up was uh, commissioned by the Youth Justice Board to undertake a piece of research um, around county lines. So the Youth Justice Board selected four local authorities to be part of a county lines pathfinder project. Um, and these areas, these four geographical areas, which, which need to remain anonymous, um, were identified by the National Crime Agency as areas with high numbers of county lines feeding into them. So it was a mixed methods research project, and it involved quantitative and qualitative data. 
So there was masses of quantitative data, which was collected from the four areas across the period 2018 and 2020. And what this data did, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, was map, mapped social exclusions against a number of variables such as ethnicity, gender, age, special educational needs and types of exclusion and other um, variables, which, which are, are too many to kind of um, include here, but things like free school meals. Um, and it covered both uh, primary and secondary schools. So this was huge data. Then there was also qualitative data, which was collected from three focus groups, which I conducted, um, which included 27 professionals across the three focus groups. And these are professionals who are working with excluded children and young people and, and who may become vulnerable to um, criminal child exploitation, because we're all familiar, I hope, with the link between school exclusions and the risk and vulnerability to criminal child ex exploitation. So there's all there's already reports and research out there to evidence that as a given. So the, the qualitative data was to uh, sh to get the views of those working with children who've been excluded and who are now within the sort of youth justice um, arena um, and and also in uh, pupil referral units and other social uh, um, excluded. Um, other other platforms which are supporting um, excluded children to maybe return back to school. Uh, what we found in this research was that there were similar patterns across. So I'm I'm only looking at ethnicity for the purposes of this seminar. So I'm only sharing with you the data on ethnicity, and what the data showed very starkly was that across all four areas in terms of ethnic disproportionality. Um, there were certain groups um, certain, from certain communities which were at real risk of exclusion, and those were the Gypsy Roma traveller, white Irish traveller, mixed white black and black Caribbean. And although there were other minoritized ethnic groups which were disproportionately excluded as well, they were to a lesser degree um, than these than these uh, groups. So this table shows this in, in a much more vi visual way. So I'll just go through this briefly. Um, so these are the areas here, and this is the national data. So it very much conforms to what the national data around permanent exclusions is showing, is that these groups are disproportionately uh, represented in terms of permanent exclusion. So we need to ask why, why this is happening. Why is there a disproportionality here? So in area one, um, Gypsy Roma Traveller was the highest disproportionality group. And again, in area two and in, in area four is a white Irish traveller. Now, this is quite interesting in terms of area three. Their highest disproportionality rate was actually what they classed as not obtained or refused. So this was a standard category used, used across the areas for school exclusions. And I would argue that there is actually a, a really important difference between not obtaining ethnicity data or, or it actually being refused. So was a, we had a very interesting discussion with this area about the, A, the importance of having ethnicity data when we're looking at any kind of disproportionality around ethnicity, but also just to ensure that there is this difference between just not obtaining it maybe not feeling that it's important to be obtained, which is concerning, but also the, the right for children, young people to refuse it, which is a whole different um, um, area, really. And so mixed white black was also um, mixed white black uh, children of that, of that ethnicity group were also very, very uh, disproportionately represented across the areas, as you can see here, as was black Caribbean. In terms of the focus group, so it was interesting to then move once the once the uh, twenty seven professionals had had all the data uh, from the the quantitative analysis. It was really interesting then to hold the focus groups to see what they made of the data because it was very much about trying to 
unpick what was going on here and this is the heart of this webinar really is that we have research and data to show that ethnic inequalities exist we have lots of it and um, it, it is down to ourselves as individual academics or practitioners or policy makers to go and explore that data and see what it actually means but it's really important um, in terms of this research and research generally in this area to un unpick what what may be happening so our, the focus groups for for this particular project showed these four main themes so once the once the focus group data was um, thematically analyzed these four themes emerged so the, the, they're in no particular order but um the first one, one was that there was a real limited understanding um, around this topic. So children and people from minoritized ethnic backgrounds being disproportionately excluded from school was insufficiently highlighted, examined or understood. So although the professionals were working in the area of school exclusions and, and um, preventing children from becoming criminally exploited or vulnerable to being criminally exploited, there didn't seem to be this um, sufficient understanding of how that linked back to um, their ethnicity or their race and the disproportionalities around that. So there was a real need to really for them to unpick that data and what it, what it actually meant for, for the children once they arrived at their services. Cuts to services um, is an important one. So when we talk about ethnic inequalities, the literature will often talk, will often talk about practice and services. So they go hand in hand, um, but they do, they do need to be looked at separately as well. So services um, in this area, um, what, what the focus groups uh, shared the the participant shared with us that where where there were culturally appropriate services it was effective for the children and young people being excluded and their families and um, however these weren't always available or easily accessible for um, minoritized ethnic children or their families um, and in some cases quite concerningly some refer referrals which should have been made to services weren't being made for um certain um, um, groups, which, you know, was talked about quite openly that professionals often wondered why certain referrals weren't being made when they should have been made. So that was really interesting to hear about. Late intervention, this was a narrative which became a bit of a distraction, although it is a reality, you know, all practitioners working with children and families the reality is that is a difficult work is busy work it's often overwhelming work um, and so that can cloud sometimes our efforts in addressing inequalities so even though i accept that this is a reality it, it shouldn't be it shouldn't become the norm we shouldn't become we shouldn't take this as a, as a given that you know um that that there's not it that by for so in terms of this research professionals were basically saying that by the time the children and young people come to their services having been excluded there's just so much work to be undertaken with them and it's almost as if nothing can be undone and um, you know schools should have intervened earlier with families there's, there's just too much that we can actually unpack now um so it became very much a distraction from the 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 fact that these disproportional disproportionalities exist so you know I, it was my role to then sort of bring the conversation back to so what are you now doing in your services knowing that these disproportionalities exist so it's about not just shaking off that responsibility it is about knowing that these children and people are experiencing in a, in a very real way this um, inequality they have been excluded very disproportionately from school um, so that whole discussion about why they're being excluded from school is something which which is a whole different area of discussion but it was just interesting that as practitioners working with these children and young people there didn't seem to be an enough time or space given within their service to services to really call this to port this disproportionality out and then to kind of um, work with the children and young people in a more positive way having acknowledged the fact that they have um, experienced this inequality 
And last but not least, um, it was really clear from the focus groups that the professionals found it very difficult to talk about race and racism. And although they agreed that these proportionalities are concerning, they had very limited ideas and plans about how to address them. So it was, it was important for me to continually take the conversation back to what the data was saying. And I, I think this is what I would say here is that professionals seek to do the best that they can for children and young people. I think, you know, I want to say that really clearly. They work very hard and tirelessly, tirelessly, as I'm sure all of you do in different sectors, working to support children and young people. However, we have to be guided by what research is saying. We can't forget what the research is actually saying, that there, are, there is a proportion of children and young people in our communities who are not getting the services that they actually uh, need to improve their well-being and to move forward in their lives and um, having experiences various disadvantages and and often adverse childhood experiences I want to move on to uh, again more current research so this is the reason I'm sharing with you the county lines project and my own research is that this is still an issue which is current so it is about really like I say re-energizing our thinking around this this is not an issue that is going away and um, it's even probably going to be more amplified in the current context um, of the crisis that we're all experiencing because we know that um, children from minoritized ethnic uh, communities experience higher poverty and um, they experience uh, various disadvantages which only get amplified when when we have um, times of austerity of, of, of any kind so child sexual abuse just a, just a brief context really is a, is a widespread form of abuse affecting one in six girls and one in 20 boys by the age of 16 so this is um reported the latest statistics that were reported in the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse report which came out this month and um, so this it is a statistic that remains concerning and it is a challenging area of child protection practice and um, children often feel shame guilt confusion and which prevents disclosure so we don't know enough about child sexual abuse um, due to these reasons in terms of the uh, topic of the seminar research shows that excuse me, child sexual abuse has been documented as being particularly low from Britain's South Asian communities. So there's quite a lot of research documenting that. Although this research is old, Mogul et al, I find it interesting research because it's one of the few pieces of research which really explicitly says that um, child sexual abuse referrals amongst the South Asian community led to quite um, less interventionist approaches from professionals than um, as compared to white children. So this, these were referrals which were being made into a hospital in the north of England, and it led to some curiosity um, amongst researchers as to why referrals were so low. And what they found was that um, professionals were felt that they needed overwhelming evidence before taking a case to case, case case conference and professionals were less keen to act where Asian children were concerned and um, so they needed more of an evidence base so what that means then I mean the reasons why that is the case can be a number um, you know often it you know again that will be a whole another seminar in itself but um for the purposes of this slide, what I'd like you to sort of really think about is what it means for the child, where an, where an approach may be less interventionist, what does that mean for their lived experience, where professionals are a bit hesitant or reluctant to intervene um, because of um, ethnic differences. Um, there's a need for professionals and support services to more carefully consider the culture of South Asian communities when respond, responding to child sexual abuse. So the Gilligan and Akhtar um, study in Bradford in 2006 was a really is a pivotal study in my area of research because it for the first time um, really kind of went out and interviewed uh, and, and had held focus groups with South Asian members of the communities in Bradford to understand what 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 they felt about child sexual abuse, what they felt was needed, what were the cultural barriers around and, and these um, issues, and and uh, 
th this approach is continuing in terms of the need for more, a more culturally sensitive approach to addressing child sexual abuse. And the um, independent inquiry report this month um, shares a statistic which documents very clearly. Um, so the Truth Project was, was part of the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, and it was where victims and survivors of child sexual abuse came forward to the inquiry to share their experiences. And what the inquiry found was that <clears throat> participants of Asian ethnicity um, did not disclose at the time of abuse. Um, 73% was the highest, um, highest uh, proportion across the ethnic groups which didn't disclose at the time of abuse. So there are real barriers with the South Asian communities and child sexual abuse. And my research excuse me, um, wanted to look at the narratives of the, the participants in my research. And it was very important for me to, I had the data, however um, uh, sparse it was, I had enough data to show that there wasn't enough, um, there's not enough known about child sexual abuse in South Asian communities. But what I wanted to really do was move, move beyond that and speak to those who had experienced child sexual abuse from the South Asian communities and explore through narrative analysis what they were they, they were saying about it. So I undertook guided conversations um, with 15 British South Asian females who were victims and survivors of child sexual abuse. Um, they were aged between 21 and 61 and from the across the uh, UK, North Midlands and South of England. They were from um, the Bangladeshi, Indian and Pakistani communities. So South Asian in my research is defined by these three communities because they make up the highest proportion of South Asian communities in Britain today. So recruiting for the research, as you can imagine, was very difficult. It took me three years and obviously COVID in between delayed it further. So. But it, it, is, it is an interesting point in terms of how we seek out participants for research. So I think this is an important point for you to sort of take away as well in terms of when we're looking at ethnic inequalities, we really need to do research in the area. And often the research can be with professionals, um, which is important, but it doesn't always give you that information or the critical information that you need to really understand the impact of ethnic inequalities on people's lives and so this was why I sort of persisted in just keeping with the victims and survivors of child sexual abuse themselves. So what literature often reports upon is, are these notions of shame and honor or shuram and izzat, as is known in the South Asian communities, as a significant barrier to disclosure and reporting. And so, what 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 these what the constructs of uh, shuram and izzat refer to or, or or stand for really is is a set of cultural norms around how male males and females within the south asian communities are expected to behave so there is this real regard for um keeping um a family's honor <coughs> a community's honor not doing anything that may jeopardize that or bring shame and honor upon a family so there's a whole body of literature around that which is increasing now um which evidence is that this is a this is a barrier to um disclosure and reporting of abuse in different contexts so I share I've shared there some um, research by scholars who have looked at sexual abuse um, of females domestic abuse honor-based abuse and violence and how it is known that reported to um, it has been shared by participants that Shuram and is a, is, a, is, a, is a significant factor to disclosing um, abuse and my study sought to extend the existing body of knowledge and apply it to uh, child sexual abuse and, and to sort of investigate really whether these constructs were also having an impact upon child sexual abuse referrals and disclosure. And it did highlight that we need a much wider research base to explore and report on the lived experiences of minoritized ethnic victims and survivors of abuse. So these are quotes from um, some of my data um, from two of the participants. Pseudonyms have been um, used. 
so Sornam said that it's definitely made me think about things with a different perspective because obviously it's weird. I mean, Shuram definitely and Izzat plays a huge part in my life. It's constantly there. It's like that shadow that will never leave you kind of thing. But I've never really broken it down the way I've done today. So I found it quite helpful. Izzat, Zara shares, Izzat is something the girl has to protect. The girl is the family's Izzat. But if somebody came and raped me, that would be the family's Izzat gone, not just my Izzat. So it's my job to protect this Izzat. And if somebody takes it away from me, it's my fault and I will have to pay for it. So it's always on the woman. We have to hold it. And it's such a heavy thing to hold for all our life. And then we have to pass it on to our daughters, right? You know, it's just, it's not fair. Where does the man come into it? So these excerpts really evidence the lived experience of what is shame and honour to these female victims of child sexual abuse. So through narrative research, narrative analysis, this their voices have been have has come through and, and is coming through in my data. And it's really important that, like I said right at the start, that we have a real insight into what it what the lived experience is in terms of um, inequalities. And the inequalities here is that we just don't know enough about their stories. We, we just don't have enough research or, any, or enough inquiry into what these cultural barriers actually mean. It's not good enough to just accept the barriers as being cultural norms and barriers. But it is about trying to really unpack and interrogate what those barriers are. Um, and one, one research participant said, finally, somebody's actually doing some research into it because it's something that needs to be done. So this, this is really important. So I'm glad I'm doing the research I'm doing. It's not easy, but it does. these kinds of quotes do keep me going because without research, without this evidence base, it's really difficult for us to make the changes we need to make in practice. Just to sum up really, obviously, because it is very relevant both to the current context of child protection practice, but also to the topic I'm talking about in my own research, the, the independent inquiry report, what that found in terms of ethnicity. So you may recall that in 2020, the inquiry published its reports report specifically on um, cultural and ethnic, ethnic barriers to reporting child sexual abuse. So this report cites that again um, and shares with us that there are cultural stereotypes and racism which can lead to failures on the part of institutions and professionals to identify and respond appropriately to child sexual abuse. And it cites again um, a male group participant who states that I did a lot of bad things, I was playing up and I think it should have been picked up on that something's wrong. But I think if a child of colour or black kid or Asian kid maybe plays up and you know does things and gets violent or whatever is sometimes seen as typical so it's really again important to hear the voice of um of the victim and survivor here and and how they 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 sort of see inequalities being played out and then how that may prevent them from coming forward in some areas the treatment by staff of children in care who were from ethnic minority communities was racist, hostile and abusive. It showed little sensitivity to particular cultural needs such as diet, hair care and clothing. And then the second two bullet points refer to data, um, ethnicity data not being accurate enough or wholesome enough to really form a picture of the, uh, the inequalities that were being played out. There are further findings in terms of the services. Um, there were six specific issues which were uh, defined in terms of services. Um, services to victims and survivors were mistrusted and considered to be inadequate. Language, as I said earlier, was a barrier to disclosure. There were additional barriers um, in, in closed communities, particularly in relation to religious and internal support. Some organisations did not recognise or support the cultural and religious needs of victims and survivors. And some organisations told the inquiry how shame and honour within communities can silence victims and survivors. And some victims from um, communities were removed from school relationships and sex education programmes and so didn't understand the concept of sexual activity. So it's important to share that just to sort of emphasise that this is still a very current issue. Now, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with the theory of intersectionality. And all I want to say about intersectionality is that this is a really important and useful 
and I would say essential theoretical lens in which to tackle ethnic inequalities and safeguarding practice. So just a little bit more in terms of the history, I'm conscious of time, intersectionality, and um, so the, this slide will be shared and um, there will be some uh, there will be an edited version of these slides due to some of my research, I, I, which cannot go out publicly at this stage. Um, but this, this slide will be there for you to view in your own time in terms of the history of intersectionality for those of you who do not, um, who aren't familiar with it. It's important we take this intersectionality approach so that we are really um, unpicking the wishes and feelings of children. So it's about looking at the whole, the child as a whole, their race, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, um, as whole as we can, so that we provide um, a really um, full some account of their experiences. In terms of transformational change, so these are just some ideas, suggestions for you to take forward um, at micro level. We need to critically reflect as individual practitioners upon how we are being child-centered. Um, how we are addressing inequalities? Are we having enough conversations about our own confidence and skills and knowledge in this area in supporting diverse children and families? What do we actually understand by the term cultural competency? And are we comfortable having conversations about our own biases and unconscious biases and even racism? And what will enable us to strengthen our practice in this area? At meso level, we're all part of an organization. What are the organizational barriers to achieving practice here? What is the environment in terms of our inequalities discussed openly, reviewed, evaluated? Does the organization have a definition of cultural competency? How do we record ethnicity of children? And do we, how, do we see the, how, why that is important? How does it assess, how do we as an organization assess competency it can be very subject, subjective. Are there frameworks, adequate frameworks to assess competency? Is our supervision reflective enough? Do we have models which allow us to explore these multi-layered, multi-dimensional issues around inequalities? And at macro level, we have the legislation, we have the frameworks, um, but how is that really feeding into our local practice really at grassroots level? There is a plethora of research evidencing these inequalities, but how does this translate? So concluding points, ethnic inequalities in child protection practice have been widely reported over a long period, long enough period of time to now be embedded into the fabric of child protection practice and policies. Inequalities continue to be significantly present in various forms, as I've shared with you today, um, and continue to impact the lives of children and families. The time is surely here now to make a more, take a more proactive approach in addressing inequalities, learning from best practice examples and integrating learning into local, regional and national practice and policy. The subject requires discussion and action at local, regional and national level. Please do not let this webinar become another means of communicating what we already know without having created a desire and an objective to address these inequalities wherever and however you can. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry I haven't left much time for questions, but um, I hand over to the questions now. Lovely. Thank you so much, Venetia. Really insightful. And um, I hope, as you say, it's prompted action thinking about how we can move forward positively. We have some questions. So I'm going to just kick off with the first one. So the first one is, it would be helpful. It would be helpful to know of any research into how inequality affects unaccompanied asylum seeking children and young people. Um, I believe the person who asked this question works in the service for unaccompanied children. And from their practice experience, that lack of access to interpreters is potentially a big issue with enabling vulnerable young people to disclose. Um, and they do see them as a, a, a group very vulnerable to criminal exploitation. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. Um, I would like to comment on it. I don't know of any research because it's not in my area, but it's, it's, certain, it's certainly something that I can look into. Um, what I will say is that, unfortunately, as, as my presentation shows, we're, we're, we're still not addressing inequalities 
for children and young people who we work with on a daily basis within within the context of just being citizens of the UK. So I feel like, you know, an accompanied asylum seeking children are unfortunately, um, you know, likely to not have a have the support at all or nowhere near the support that they need um, at the, in terms of addressing inequalities. They are seriously disadvantaged in lots of ways, um, socioeconomically, prejudices, um, just, just adapting to living in a new country. Um, so it is a whole body of uh, research which does require a lot more attention. But I will look into um, some research to share on our website. Thanks, Venetia. Um, another question is, what can managers do to develop practitioner confidence in working with diverse children and families? So I think to start off with, it is about having that open and honest conversation about what they're doing currently. Um, and it's not about feel, make it, making any, any manager or any organisation feel inferior or inadequate. And I think, I think it, it is about moving forward now. So, uh, you know, any manager who wants to make real change in this area um, needs to start looking at what's currently in place, how effective it is, and what can be do, what can be done to improve practice and often there are many practitioners who have an interest in this area so it is about drawing upon the resources you may already have in your team around this um, some people have a real aptitude and a real passion for this area so it's about kind of really being creative um, not creating work for yourselves but be creating it in terms of resources you already have and drawing upon those to really keep this on the agenda in your organizations Wonderful. Thank you. Sorry, another question's just come in, so I'm going to read it as I read it. Um, may I ask if any of your participants had a diagnosed disability? Working in a disabled children and young people's team, I wonder how this would affect these families and practice for professionals taking the disability into consideration as well as respecting culture and belief. No, no, they did. They didn't have a disability. I mean, they did have. Um, I would. I would share um, lots of mental health problems. Some of them, obviously, be due to the nature of the abuse, and also not being able to disclose the abuse. None of my participants actually reported the abuse. So there were. There's obviously this kind of you know mental um, health issues, which they, which most of them did sort of um, experience in various points in their lives. Um, but I think disability generally is, is something which really is seen as a, an additional um, problem, unfortunately. It's not integrated, I would argue, and I think many would agree with me, into working with children and young people. So the intersectional approach that I was talking about, which you know is something that we would really integrate disability, race, gender, um, everything. But at the moment, research hasn't really, from, from what I've seen, drawn out the, the links with disability, unfortunately. But it is something that, you know, does amplify the disadvantage, uh, you know, like a, an accompanied asylum seeking children. I think, you know, there is there are other factors which amplify the, the disadvantage even further. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, you've been thanked in chat for your response to that as well. Um, I know we've only got about two minutes um, and I have two more questions. So one of them is linked to the first question we have, which mentioned translators. So interpreting services are not always available to address language barriers. So what can we do in such circumstances? Yeah, I mean, I think it is it is very variable across the regions in terms of interpreting services and dependent on your demographic, local demographic. Um, of, of the communities around you. So I think it is about seeking what you can within the means you have. Um, and, and there's a lot of what not to do. So I, th I think the reality is we are dealing with lots of different languages in certain uh, parts of the country. It is about trying to be proactive as an individual practitioner um, and going as far as you can in terms of getting the, the right interpreting services for, for the families. That, that are that are um, you're working with. All right, thank you so much. And uh, you know what, we've got less than a minute, but I'm going to ask the final question and see what we can squeeze in with the last couple of seconds. How can practitioners integrate knowledge about the broader socioeconomic inequalities experienced by minoritized communities into their daily practice? 
I think this is about taking a real bird's eye view, a real sort of systems view about the children and families we're supporting. So I know that, you know, very, very often we can't do anything about those broader socioeconomic um, dis disadvantages experienced by children and families. But it is about being sensitive to those experiences and being aware of how the disproportionality affects certain minoritized communities so for example poverty is known to affect um, minoritized ethnic children and families at, uh, to a much greater level and um, that they tend to you know communities tend to be living in areas of serious disadvantage um, and so it's about kind of being sensitive to that I think that's the minimum that we can do that's brilliant thank you I mean appreciate that the various theories you've you've apply today and, and thinking about this um, and I, I, I've really valued, valued your discussion even though I work with you it's nice seeing it all come together and and be presented this way I think we're going to end it there I haven't had any more questions come in we've run out of time but can I just say thank you to everybody who's attended today and a huge thank you to Venetia for your presentation today Best thank wish you thank you very much